Do you remember the moment when you entered the World Wide Web for the very first time? For me, it was in 1994. I was an exchange student in the US working on my master thesis, and Habib, you were finishing your, your doctorate degree two years ago, and you're 25 now. So you don't know how it was, how to browse for a book back in these days of us in Generation X. It, you went to the ground floor of the library, and there were these long rows of wooden boxes, and in each box there were paper cards, and on each paper card there was the name of a book and the subtitle and a few way keener, uh, key, key uh, words. Um, and, well, if you found something in these boxes, on the paper cards, that looked interesting, that could be worth something interesting for, for your thesis or whatever you're working on, uh, you went to the bookshelf upstairs, and if you're lucky, the book was there, and often you weren't lucky, and sometimes it was even worse, the book was there, but the pages you needed were torn out by someone who didn't really believe in sharing information. <laughs> well, one day I was doing uh, assembling books and went down to the computer lab where I was writing and wanted to, to, to work on a chapter, on the next chapter, and uh, went down to one of these public computers, and instead of writing, I saw an icon uh, which was labeled mosaic. I had heard about it, that it was sort of a program that way, where you could access something like the internet or World Wide Web, but didn't really know the difference. But I clicked on it and uh, well, I saw this. And I started to, as they said, search the web. I typed in some keywords concerning my master thesis, and I immediately felt, well, I've just entered a new kingdom of information. When nobody tore out pieces, wasn't interested in sharing information, but where you could easily browse for books and find new sources, and even in that very rogue stage, the internet was there, it was, it was plentiful. And it felt like a magic kingdom of information, or as Kevin um, Kelly, the co-founder of the magazine Wired, later put it, it felt like a magic window, a tool that was so powerful that in former times, kings would have gone to war in order to get it. Well, I finally finished my master thesis, went back to Germany and became a journalist. If you're a sports journalist, you should better not be a fan of the teams you're reporting on. Uh, I was reporting on basically every aspect of the digital revolution was upcoming. And, well, I was a fan. I was really, really enthusiastic about what I was writing. And I liked the people I was writing on. Um, like, I had the chance to to write an early story on two guys in Stanford that um, were working on a new search engi engine that was called um, Backrub. And these two guys said that they had the mission and the ambition to organize the information of the world in a new way and then make it accessible to everyone. Well, they sort of kept their promise. Two guys were Sergey Brin and Larry Page, and Two years later, the search engine they were programming as students was called Google. And along with this promise, this early promise of the internet to make information accessible, accessible to, to everyone, there was this second big promise I also really believed in and I enthousi enthusiastically uh, wrote on, and that was that, well, the internet would make the economy more democratic. The Canadian fast-forward thinker, Dan Don Tapscott, condensed, in, condensed it in a wonderful term, Wikinomics, which basically meant that every individual or small unit, a small company, could do things that beforehand, before the internet, could have only been done by, by large companies, by, by global players. That was the second big promise. To create an economy 
which was more equal in opportunity, and in the long run, more fair in terms of um, um, the share or the distribution of wealth. Well, concerning the second promise, 15 years later, our view back then might have been a little bit naive, and it was our fault that we've been naive, because we just could have read a book written by two Berkeley um, economists, Carl Shapiro and Hal Varian, uh, who already in the late 90s had argued in their book, um, in a book that was, uh, that, that was called um, The uh, Information Rules, a Strategic Guide to the Network Economy, that, well, the digital economy is based on platforms, and if these platforms manage to attract a critical mass of users or customers, you'll have network effects on that platform. And if you have network effects on platforms, you have exponential growth, which leads, in the end, to that other competitors will be forced out of business, because in the end it leads to monopolistic structures in the market. Well, the Swedish pop band, ABBA, did put that theorem in much simpler terms 20 years before that. Um, the winner takes it all. And seldom in history, I think, economists and um, Swedish conventional wisdom have been as right in foreseeing the future, because that's what happened. The internet is dominated by winners, superpowers, who didn't really leave very much room for competitors in their segment of the market. So, concerning the second promise, the internet will democratize the economy, the internet is notoriously lagging behind that promise. However, the good thing about the digital world is that things in general are not forever. The internet right now feels like it had been around forever. It's so, so um, ubiquitous around us. It feels, well, it's all set and it'll, it'll, be, it'll, it'll stay that way in principle. <laughs> Uh, for the rest of our lives, but that's not the case. There's a technology of, at Brink that does have the same potential to change things as much as browsers, di browsers did in terms of making information accessible. And, well, you all heard the name. Um, if you are a banker, you might even be afraid of blockchain. Because in the context of currency or cryptocurrency, this technology behind Bitcoin has the ability to take out the bank or the business. Or in other words, you can do banking without banks, which is a fairly interesting prospect, I would say. But blockchain does not only have the ability, potentially, to take banks out of banking, but a lot of trusted middlemen, platforms, out of the powerful role they do have right now. There has been a lot of hype and confusion about blockchain in general, and Bitcoin in particular. And in general, the discussion goes that way, that well, well, we hear about the principle, and then the technicians get into technical details, and nobody understands anything anymore. And if you go into the technical details, blockchain is indeed a very, very complicated matter. But the principle, and the principle idea behind it, is fairly simple. As the name applies, uh, a blockchain is a chain of data blocks. Let's take the example of the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. User A transfers 100 Bitcoins to user B. That transaction is built in a small data block. 
that data block is linked into a blockchain. And the whole blockchain is downloaded not only on the computer of A and B, but to everyone in the network. In other words, blockchain is nothing else but an innovative way to store data in a whole network in a very secure way, thanks to cryptography. The um, venture capitalist, German descent, lives in America, Albert Wenger, did put that in a concept. He said that um, blockchain is able to be organizationally decentralized and logically centralized. It sounds very complicated again, but actually it isn't. If you look at the left row, organizationally centralized basically means that the system is controlled by a single institution. It could be a company, like in this case, PayPal or uh, Microsoft or Vexo, or it could also be a government or another powerful institution. If you look on the rows, logically centralized or logically decentralized, that basically means if it's logically centralized, all the data is stored in a single database, which means that everyone who's allowed to make a query to the database gets the same answer. Conversely, logically decentralized means that data is not stored in a central database, but in general on the computer of each user. You send me an, uh, an Excel sheet uh, with some content. I make a change in it. You won't realize unless I inform you and I send it back. Well, the very wild systems that are organizationally decentralized and logically decentralized, like email. And the important innovation in provided by the blockchain is that it makes the top right quadrant possible. When data is stored organizationally centralized and logically centralized, that obviously puts the organization who does it in a very powerful position. With blockchain, you can take it off. Because you have a logically centralized database on each computer of each member of the network. That's the principle. And in economic terms, that means you can build platforms with the network effects that grow without having a central owner of this platform. Don Tapscott calls blockchain a trust protocol. Or to put it more precisely, blockchain is a way in which to, to create uh, trust among a large group of people who don't know each other and therefore don't trust each other by giving them a ledger that everybody has access to, but nobody can forge, thanks to cryptography in a clever system. What does it mean? It means that we can now build peer-to-peer -peer platforms that do what we ever hope for, that rise to the promise of the second promise of the internet. Blockchain is the perfect technical backbone of a sharing economy deserving its name. It's a technological mega chance 
to disrupt the disruptors that have grown to economic superpowers, which is economically rational. They just take, they, they take, take advantage of the asymmetri asymmetrical uh, structure the internet economy is built on. But they're also the reason why the second promise hasn't fulfilled yet. Say so you want a revolution? I don't know if it comes by blockchain, but I know that the technology carries the potential to do it. How do we start? Well, just with, like with the very first browsers. If you want to, if, a, if a, a new technology wants to kick off, kick off, people have to experience it, just like we experienced going into the internet with the browser for the very first time. So, if you want to be part of this revolution, take your smartphone, download a Bitcoin wallet, and um, well, go to a bar which accepts Bitcoins, and then you might want to order a drink, and maybe you might sense that it even just tastes better when neither government or banks are involved. Cheers.